Right now we've got a very special family that's going to come and share with us uh, our kickoff to the service in our Advent season, the Overin family. Malachi 3, 1 through 4. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way for me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom, whom you desire, will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in days gone by, as in former years. For many of us, the call to home is one of joy and hope. We can't wait to reconnect with family, with history and tradition, with a wonderful time of freedom and loving support. We can't wait to go home. There are those who fear going home. However, there are times when going home brings back memories that are not so good, not so healing. We are reminded of it of when we didn't fit in, when we didn't measure up, when we weren't loved like we needed to be loved. Home can be a difficult place for some. The prophet Malachi tells us that even when we are in the hottest of fires, there's a presence that can make us better, who can refine and purify. John the Baptist tells us that the Roman home is always under construction. Mountains leveled and valleys filled in to make smooth the path that leads us to our true destination, where we can live in peace and unity with all. We light these candles, the candle of hope and the candle of peace, as a sign of our assurance that throw through the road is hard. We, we believe is, it is worth the journey. It is time to go home. I know we have some kids that are going to be uh, helping with our children's pageant in a couple of weeks. And uh, now is the time when you're going to work your way out of here to get prepared for that. So I want to invite you to do a mad dash. But listen, listen to the instructions for just a minute. Come this way first. Come up front first. Come up here first. Come on. Come on. Just quickly. I know. It's scary up here. But together it's a little bit better. Come on up here just for a minute. Come on. Get into the, we're going to call this a huddle. Come in close. Yeah, to each other. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Oh, man, there's a whole, there's a whole herd of them. Okay, I don't know all of your names, so on the count of three, just tell me your name, okay? You ready? One, two, three. Claire. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> we're going to send all of those names out of here, but before we do that, we're going to pray for you, Okay. So I'm going to be the voice of one, and the church is going to pray for you also. God, thank you for these little ones, all different ages and names and backgrounds. But God, the kids that you have called to lead us right now. So Lord, would your Holy Spirit move in their lives in ways like never before. May they experience the grace of God and the joy of the Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, this guy right here, you're going to lead the army right that way. Yep, go on. The rest of you, yep. Onward. I don't know exactly where it happens, but somewhere along the way we lose that and we become this. I'm not sure what context you took that in, but we're going to assume it's the same one that I intended it. I don't want to lose that childlike faith. And if I could just be so, uh, so blunt as to say that childlike faith is not childish. That's a sermon for another day. It's a sermon for another day. But childlike faith is not childish, but the scripture says that let us become like children, right? In our faith. So before we dive into uh, part number two, this fear of coming home and the uh, series titled Come Home for Christmas, I want to invite you to pray for me this morning. Because apart from the spirit of the living God, well, we're all 
in a rough spot. But with God's help, we're in a much better place and there's hope. So uh, would you pray for me this morning that God would use me and that God would prepare your hearts as he has been preparing mine for this moment in time and uh, that he would be glorified through it. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your church. This beautiful bride which is adorned clothed in righteousness. Father, as you prepare our hearts now to speak to us, would your spirit continue to prepare my heart. God, that in these moments right now that we would bring honor and glory to your name, that we would be faithful ambassadors, and Lord, that we would hear from you Because when you speak, there's power. There's hope. There's assurance. It's good to be here this morning, Lord. Use me if it be thy will. In your name, amen. My mother's not here with us today, so she's fair game for talking about. I don't know if she's online with us. If you are, Mom, I love you. My mother was born uh, during the Great Depression. Some of you were maybe born during the Great Depression and navigated some of that, or your parents talked about that to you. But the year was 1939, not when my mother was born. She was already alive by 1939. But our country had experienced some of its most dismal years, I think is a safe way. I mean, we look now and we get a little bit depressed, but man... There's a reason it was called the Great Depression. (laughs) Things were bleak. It seemed like all hope was lost. And in 1939, our country was in the throes of not just the Depression, but the, the Dust Bowl had displaced thousands. Our world was about to go to war. Millions and millions of innocent people were about to be killed. And yet on the silver screen appeared the Wizard of Oz. Does anybody remember the Wizard of Oz? You probably know this iconic story, right? Dorothy and Toto carried away in a tornado to a magical world of Oz where they meet a few unlikely characters. They meet a a scarecrow who's scared. They meet a lion who's a coward. And they meet a tin man who has no heart brain, (laughs) heartless, sorry. And yet they traveled this yellow brick road, didn't they? With what hopes? They were fighting the Wicked Witch of the West. You remember the last line of the film? Yes, she does remember it. I'm not anywhere near like Dorothy and I'm not wearing the right kind of shoes but if I were to click them together three times and say there's no place like home there's no place like there's no place like what comes to mind when you think of home in this euphoric state maybe it's the Hallmark movie the Norman Rockwell This space where everything is perfect, fire crackling in the fireplace. We have a wood stove, not a fireplace. It's not quite the same, but once in a while you see a flame. It oftentimes brings memories of something comfortable, safe. A space we long for. Remember John Deborah singing about it, right? Take me home, country roads. What's the next line? To the place I belong. West Virginia, mountain mama, right? Take me home. Country roads. We long for it. We desire it. For most of us, this is what home means. It's what our hearts long for, a 
a space we can go to where, well, even, yes, God exists, right? We've got this euphoric idea in our minds. God is here and all is well. It's like you're waiting for it. You're, on the, you're, you're kind of anticipating what's next, I think. But what if we stopped working for this space where God might exist and simply embraced what God is and, in fact, has actually always been doing? Friends, that's what Advent is all about. It's this living in the space of already and not yet, but with the hope of Emmanuel, God with us. Last week we watched a a movie uh, titled, I don't remember the title of it, I guess. It was the Chosen Christmas movie. I don't know what the title of it was. The Messengers, thank you. I knew somebody would be able to help me out with that. And uh, did anybody else go to that? I saw some of you there, so you've got to raise your hands. You have to at least acknowledge that you were there, right? <laughs> it was wonderful. It wasn't what I expected. Not on the front end, but it ended how I kind of anticipated a movie to go. But I took a line away from there that just, like, grabbed my attention. And it was this line from a shepherd to Mary that just simply said, people must know. And I thought about that all weekend long. And I started to answer the question just like the actors and the singers and the artists did of what must they know? And that varies a little bit from person to person, right? So what you would want to share with somebody else might be a little bit different than what I want to share with somebody else. But the reality is people must know. People must know what home is really like. These images and these things that we portray are euphoric. In a state of euphoria, it lacks reality. For some, as our littlest of friends read, home might not be something that you want to go to. Home for you might have been a really difficult thing. Home might be laced with feelings of guilt, inefficiency, neglect, abandonment. You might have even experienced what it is to not be loved. Maybe we're afraid of the punishment that seemingly looms or awaits us. You see, the connections in the natural world to the spiritual realm are really close sometimes. As your pastor, it's my responsibility to handle very carefully the Word of God but to also take that which is spiritual and allow you to see it in the natural world so that maybe there's transformation by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we receive this thing called hope. Because hope, when it is manifest, will not disappoint us. So, in our Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me this second week to the Gospel of Luke again. In fact, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke uh, throughout Advent. Last week, we looked at the end of the story with a seemingly hopeless situation and found a glimmer of hope. Today we're going to look in the middle of the desert and find peace. Has anybody been to the middle of the desert? One or two of you? So you know what a desert looks like. It's kind of arid and dry and occasional things, but not much life, typically. And uh, so bear with me from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, the first six verses. You'll find it on the overheads or uh, in your Bibles or in your pew Bibles that are available to you. And one thing that you should know probably on the backstory is that this passage comes right on the heels of when uh, Mary and Joseph did the unthinkable and lost their baby. They lost the Messiah for just a few minutes. And uh, we find him in the temple doing his father's work, it says in chapter 2. But then we pick up the story right here and all four Gospels give the account of what is taking place here. They all tell it a little bit differently, but they all talk about this coming of John the Baptist or the baptizer and the baptism of Jesus. And it says this in the third uh, chapter. It says, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitus, man, I went to seminary, I can't even pronounce these words, And Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. 
you should probably ask your question the same thing that I ask yourselves the question that I asked myself. Why is that important? We're going to come back to that. It says, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, some geographical information, some statistical data is being given to you right here. And then it says this. It says, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of of sins. For as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness or a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough roads smooth, and all people, say that word with me just briefly, all All people will see God's salvation. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So back to this dynamic of a fear of coming home. I was a a boy once. Sometimes I still act like a boy. (laughs) My wife will affirm that. My girls will probably affirm that too. Dad, are you going to ever grow up? I don't know. And um, my mom didn't know these stories until uh, later in life, which is probably a good thing because she might have killed me. I might not have made it to manhood. <laughs> when I was a boy, um, I did what wasn't uh, a, a real favorable thing. And we, had a, we lived in the parsonage. My dad was the preacher. You've heard this narrative before. And uh, in the parsonage, there, our rooms were in the basement, And my brother David and I, we split the room up and we shared half and half. And uh, we had those little basement windows. Is anybody familiar with those little windows? They're about like this basement, ground level windows. And uh, we didn't have an enclosure on the outside to kind of make it a a well area. It was just kind of open. And I got this bright idea one time that it would be good to sneak out that window. And then I realized that I could do this all the time and not get found out by my parents because they were two stories above me, and I was pretty quiet getting out. Now, the scripture says that nothing good happens in darkness. It's true. <laughs> it's true. There's, there's no lying about that, okay? Um, and there's no way we can stretch our minds to think that that's not true. And uh, I was guilty of stealing my parents' car. Yeah, this is, this is where my mom didn't know this early on. Uh, from the age of 14 to 16. Yeah, that's, that's problematic. For the officers in the room, I'm grateful I didn't find you those nights. <laughs> or you didn't find me those nights. And um, I remember while I was engaging in this stuff, I was having a great time, it seemed like. But there was always this a bit of adrenaline rush. Every car that we went by, my heart would beat faster. And at one point, we pulled up to a stop light, and an officer pulled up next to us. And these spindly little boys sat up real straight and tall and prayed that he wouldn't look our direction. And I remember coming home one night, and um, every time I would pull back into the driveway. Actually, we didn't pull into the driveway. We figured out that it would be too loud. So we'd push the car back into the driveway. <sighs> I was an idiot. And I would start the process of going to the house, and I'd be sneaking around in the dark and praying that the lights weren't on, and my mom was never asleep, it seemed like. And I remember I would just, I could almost see it in my mind's eye, opening that basement window, and my couch in my bedroom was right there, and peeking in and seeing my father. Like, it would give me serious anxiety, rightfully so. Right? I was doing something I shouldn't be doing. And I remember I would crack that window open and I would peek in with my eyes and I'd be like, Whew. I was afraid. That's what anxiety is, is fear. And fear has to do with punishment, Scripture says in 1 John 4. In fact, it says that there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. And because fear has to do with punishment for the one who fears has not been made perfect in love. 
I pushed on the window one night and it didn't open. And then my heart really started to pound. And I'm pushing and wiggling and I hear this. I'm like, I'm dead. I should just run away from home and never come back. And I hear this squeaky little voice, Joseph. That's my best impersonation of my brother David. And I proceeded to get mad. Open that window or I'm going to kill you. He says, you're really in a great spot to make those types of threats, aren't you? (laughs) Well, the rest of the story is that uh, he eventually let me in. I delivered papers for him for a year. (laughs) A year while he collected all the pay. (laughs) The fear of that coming home had to do with the punishment and this this disconnect between myself and what was happening. As we go back to the Gospel of Luke, I want to share with you just a couple of things because the Father's heart and my Father's heart, if he were still here, he would say this to you. The Father's heart is that you would be reconciled to him. That you would know that it's okay. Reconciliation, though, is a process. Reconciliation is something that we oftentimes don't engage with, but we see the beginning of reconciliation in this passage when a crazy man who's covered in camel's hair and eating locusts and honey is proclaiming this very untimely message, but maybe it's actually a really timely message of repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Remember I told you we'd come back to the significance of the first verse. You see, most people see things in the realm of the magnitude of what's going on. Rome is in leadership at the time, in the first century, and all of these people kind of signify the magnificence of the, of the Roman Empire, right? It was one of the largest empires, lasted one of the, it, 700, I think, years, right? Hundreds of years their reign was. Huge significance. They were a powerhouse. Inside of that, we see... Annas and Caiaphas, the priesthood of the Jewish people, leaders in their own realm, this magnificent thing. And then we find God speaking not through the big government, not through the big religious institution, but through a crazy man eating honey, dressed in camel's hair, in the middle of the desert. You see, God doesn't always do things the way that we humans think God should. The process is sometimes slow and gradual. But if we engage in this process, the very word that came to John comes to you and to me. You see, the prophet Isaiah in the 40th chapter predicts that this is what's going to happen. And when the scriptures say something is going to happen, guess what? It happens. So when he said there's going to be one coming in the wilderness, making this declaration of prepare the way, right? He would be preaching a baptism of forgiveness of sins. By the way, that passage in Isaiah is a message of hope to a people that are broken and hurting. A message that God hasn't abandoned us or you as the case may be. So what do we see in this process of repentance? Fancy Greek word for repentance is metanoia, right? You don't really need to know that, but it's kind of fun to say, okay? We speak English now, but uh, the Greek word there is metanoia, and and part of the process that we miss sometimes is the significance of the word, right, and what it really means. Repentance doesn't simply mean saying, I'm sorry, I won't do that anymore, right? It, It means an actual transformation. See, the Greek word means to change in one's way of life, Complete change. In other words, it's it's complete change resulting from repentance or spiritual conversion. So when God has done something magnificent within us, we turn away from it. The beginning process of reconciliation is repentance. Remember, God's about to reconcile all of humanity in three short years. I'm not talking about in 2025 or 2024, whatever. What year are we in? 21? It doesn't really matter. (laughs) talking about 
when he's, John the Baptist is beginning to speak here, in three years the Messiah will be crucified. And that vein for reconciliation where wholeness happens can begin. There are three things that we see in repentance, though. The first is that repentance needs to start with a revealing of who we are. So separate for a moment with me the natural world and this longing to go home to this euphoric space and allow God to maybe search your heart a little bit like he has mine over and over and over again. That anxiety of sitting outside the window and the fear that had to do with the punishment, right? All of that. And yet God is saying, come on. I've done all of this work for you. Just engage with me for a moment. Just for a moment. You see, the Holy Spirit allows us to look at ourselves soberly or of sound mind, to have a clear assessment of who we are. Nobody can escape sin. None of us is exempt from that. We've preached sermons on this. We've tried to make it creative. We've tried to help you understand it in practical ways. But the reality is we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Because God can't be present with sin. But the message of the gospel is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, made restitution for us and is reconciling us unto God's self. But repentance is the work on our side when we say, okay, Lord, I recognize that. You know why I wouldn't be afraid of opening that window is if I was never outside on the other side of the window. If I live in the presence of God right now and believe that actually Emmanuel is true, that God is with us. You see, not only does it reveal, but it revises how we live our lives. We start to stand a little straighter when we know that we're walking with the Lord. We can have confidence in the midst of difficult situations because we know that God is with us. We know that in the midst of maybe difficult situations that have no way out, that God has said, it's okay, just sit tight here for a minute and see what I'm doing. I remember when we were in Dubai, that's my really only experience in desert places, right? We were actually in Dubai and Ajman. And uh, I remember we were sitting on top of this sand dune, looking out, and there was Like nothing except for camels, wild camels. Bizarre, I'd never seen them in the wild. Big animals. And absolutely nothing else. And the gentleman that we were with said to us, go find find a spot where there's nobody else and you sit with God for a little bit on these hills. And I found myself thinking, my goodness, I'm sitting in a place like John the Baptist was coming out of. A desert. It was hot. I was wearing a long sleeve shirt. If I could have been wearing my cowboy boots, I would have been, but I didn't bring them on that trip. They were too hard to get in and out of in the airport. It's way too practical. I remember sitting there thinking, my goodness, Lord, what would you have me do? And I, I don't hear audible voices. I've told you that. But I knew in my spirit that the invitation from God was to sit right there for a moment in this difficult space in this desert, and see what God does as he revealed to me the things that were difficult and the things that I needed to let go of and the relationships that God wanted to restore. You see, repentance is about God revealing and God revising our actions. And the last little nugget of gold I want to give you comes in the final declarations here it says prepare the way for the lord and make straight paths for him for every valley shall be filled in and every mountain and hill will be made low the crooked road shall become straight and the rough ways smooth and all of mankind will see god's salvation you see i believe that god's desire is that we would all know god i believe that with all of my heart That every single one of you and every single human being on the face of the earth that has ever walked the earth and that will ever walk the earth is created in the image of God. And that God desires them and that God desires you. 
Maybe home isn't a place that you long to go to because the natural world has been too difficult for you to understand what God's desire is. But I'm here as a messenger of the gospel to tell you this morning, and if you miss everything else that is ever shared, these next few words will change your life. God loves you. Period. God loves you, God delights in you, and God desires a deep relationship with you where you don't have that fear, where you don't have that anxiety, where home really is a place that we can experience community and peace and joy. And we all have that desire. But the moment we exit this safe space, the walls come back up. Maybe allow the Holy Spirit this morning to do some reconciliation in your life to bring you back to center, to reveal some things that are difficult maybe, for you to leave at the throne of grace, to maybe sit for a moment in the fact that God doesn't want to just wash you. He wants to continually purify you as the prophet Malachi told us about earlier, this purification process so that you can know what it is to walk with the Lord day in and day out. See, I believe that just like that messenger the other day told Mary that people must know. And they must know that God loves them. And you must know that God loves you. And that God delights in you. And the fear and the anxiety that you have has to do with punishment. And God's desire is to wipe the slate clean. And to make you stand upright without spot or blemish. Someone earlier, was. we were talking about Christmas. I haven't forgotten. Oh, she's not in here right now. Shoot. One of our littlest ones is uh, excited about a Barbie car for Christmas. I know that my longings in life have changed, as have probably yours. I've come to this spot where it's no longer about the gifts under the tree. In fact, we've actively talked about how to reduce the number of that. So it's not about the gifts, but it's about the gift. And to really not lose sight of what God is doing and has done. God wants to have a relationship with you. He's inviting you to come home today. You don't need to be afraid of our Heavenly Father. Even if your earthly father and your earthly experiences are terrible, God will reconcile in the midst of brokenness. That's the beauty of the gospel. Would you pray with me, church? Holy God, thank you for not failing us. For being consistent for being a constant source of hope in the midst of hopelessness. Lord, as you speak to your church this morning, would they come alive? Would they have this sense of passion and urgency? Would they have this sense of excitement and joy that comes from hearing, well done. It's good to be home. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. In the middle of Luke's gospel, we find a boy and his father. And the boy makes this declaration to his father that he wishes his father was dead. He doesn't say those exact words, but he says he wants his share of the inheritance. You know the story probably, right? It's the, the, the prodigal son. I've changed the title of that, and there's, there's no title in the scriptures, by the way, so you can change the titles of those things. It's okay. I changed the title of that to it's really about a faithful father. Right? A loving father. A merciful father. Because it says that as the boy is returning to home, he comes to his senses. That's a very important line. He comes to his senses, and all of a sudden he begins to go home. And he's walking this dusty road, and he sees in the distance this man running towards him. You know what Jewish men didn't do? They didn't run. Because they were old. No, that's not why. <laughs> Because they were dignified. 
And dignified men didn't run, apparently, I guess. I don't know. But it didn't happen. And he sees this man running, and this embrace takes place. You don't have to fear coming home. The fear is on your side, not on God's side. All of the work has been done. So today, as you come to this table where we celebrate not only what has been, but where we look forward to what is about to be, my prayer is that you would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because there's power in the Holy Ghost. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread. He broke that bread. He gave it to his disciples. He says, hey, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to the Father and he shared that cup with his disciples. He said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant. My blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, and as often as you do, do this in remembrance of me. So, holy God, we invite you here today to these ordinary gifts of bread and cup. Father, may they become for us the body and blood of Christ. Oh, Jesus, that we who are many may become one in the household of God. That we might become a broken and poured out drink offering. That those who are wandering around in a wilderness and are finding themselves in periods of hopelessness might experience the river of life. But God, may it begin with us. Continue to do your work, Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit. In your mighty and matchless name we pray. Lord, as you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Church, hear the good news. Christ Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you, you are forgiven. The body of Christ broken for you and for me, and the blood of Christ has been shed, that we may have life, even life everlasting. There's an old saying that the, the road to peace is marked with war. And as I watch the church come forward today to these tables, God loves you, friends. And he's done the work. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God. Jesus, with these gifts, these tangible items, be used for your glory as others receive forgiveness of sins. In your name we pray. Amen. Church, this Christmas, you don't have to be afraid to come home. Your Heavenly Father delights in you. The door is easily opened, and the light is always on. May the Lord Jesus Christ be before you to lead you, beside you to justify you, behind you to defend you, and above you to guide you. Might Jesus, the risen Christ, the one who has saved you, who has given you the power and the glory be within you, living it out fully so that you might live in love and community with all of your neighbors. Now go and love the hell out of them in Jesus' name. Amen.